All right. I would like to welcome Brandon to, for his talk about um, automating um, Python's eBay API. And I see he has an introduction slide already up, so I'll let him introduce himself a bit. We're really excited for uh, Brandon, a member of our community, uh, yeah, talking to us about Python. So want to take it away, Brandon? Yeah, thank you. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Brandon Carnell. I currently work for a uh, small residential tree company in Monroe where sadly I do not program, but I trim and remove trees all day. Uh, but outside of work, <clears throat> I really enjoy spending my free time learning to program. And I also run an eBay store where I sell all different sorts of trading cards. So the uh, project overview, the objective was to automate as much of my monthly sales data retrieval and spreadsheet creation as possible. For a uh, very long time, I was doing this the old fashioned way tabbing back and forth between my eBay sales page and a Google sheet. And on top of it being incredibly time consuming, I would also always enter the data in wrong and have to go back and fix it. So uh, one day I just, <clears throat> I told myself there has to be a better way. Uh, so the first thing we're gonna have to do before we can even write any code is uh, create an eBay developers account. And you do that by going to this uh, website, developer.ebay.com. So your eBay developers account is separate from your eBay sellers account. And what your developers account is going to give you access to is your app ID, your dev ID, and your cert ID. And all those things are necessary, <clears throat> excuse me, to establish a connection to eBay's API. And then once your program is ready for production, um, there's a page on this website to log into your actual sellers account and it'll generate a user token for you. So you can actually get your data from eBay's API. Uh, other than that, this website has a lot of really helpful documentation, and it also has a pretty active uh, developers forum where you can chat with people who are trying to create similar programs to yours. So I definitely recommend checking it out. So um, Python libraries, we're going to use a lot of different libraries and modules uh, for this program. I like to think of Python libraries as tools in our toolbox that are gonna make our job uh, as easy as possible. So these next few slides, I'm kind of gonna go over uh, what a lot of these libraries do and how they're helpful and how we're gonna use them in our program today. So first up is Pandas. Pandas is a very powerful data library in Python. Uh, it has a lot of really cool features, one being its data frame that's gonna store our data in rows and columns, just like a spreadsheet. And we're gonna use it by organizing our sales data into a Pandas data frame, and then we're gonna export it to a CSV file. So uh, working with currency in programming can be hard, right? Um, anyone like myself who prior to this project had never written any sort of code that did anything uh, dealing with financial calculations, I feel like basic intuition might be to use floating point numbers. But um, if you have ever seen the movie Office Space, you will know that you cannot use floating point arithmetic in, uh, in programming. And that is because floating point arithmetic will cause rounding errors over time. And that's due to the way that it's stored in memory. So in financial calculations, every cent matters. So we're going to use Python's built-in decimal module to ensure we are able to perform precise decimal arithmetic. And we're going to do that because it offers uh, powerful features like rounding control that are going to allow us to decide when something gets rounded off and then also how it gets rounded off. So another thing that can be challenging is trying to work with time zones, whether that be um, converting a variable or trying to change something for a timestamp for an API. But uh, you can manage all of these things with the uh, PyTZ library. That stands for Python time zone. And what this library allows us to do is make accurate time zone conversions. And it also helps us create time zone aware date time objects. And it does this with its dot localized method that ensures our date time objects are assigned the correct time zone that we want. And it's going to automatically adjust for daylight savings times when we do this. Uh, if you weren't using this library, trying to adjust for daylight savings time would be something you have to do on your own. Uh, we're gonna use it to convert our naive date time objects into time zone aware timestamps for accurate filtering from eBay's API. And I would like to uh, quickly explain the difference between a time zone aware daytime object and a naive one. So if I had a variable that was just September 1st at midnight and I ran it, um, that would be a naive daytime object. My computer would have no idea what to do with that. 
Whereas time zone aware is when you use the dot localized method and you can assign it like Eastern Standard Time, for an example, so it knows what it needs to be running in. Uh, the eBay Standard Developers Kit Library, this is going to be a really helpful library uh, for our program. It's going to simplify the process of working with eBay's API. It's going to handle authentication, um, our API requests, and even our error handling. How we're going to use it is to connect to the eBay trading API to pull real-time sales data from my eBay store. Uh, we're also going to be using a, a .env file. And what a uh, .env file is, is it is somewhere to store things like your passwords, your API keys, and your user tokens. And it keeps them separate from your code. And this is helpful because it prevents you from accidentally uploading your API keys to a public GitHub repo where someone could have a web crawler or something like that that is <clears throat> um, going to... I got a Zoom loading thing on my screen. But... Uh... Just reshare my screen. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Okay, like I said, it'll just prevent you from uh, posting your sensitive information onto GitHub or even, you know, like having your password hard coded into your script and presenting it to an audience. That would be pretty embarrassing. So it's pretty uh, a good habit to get in to use a .env file. Um, so this slide and the next few are kind of going to be an introduction to the flow of the project, as well as uh, some of the challenges we're going to have to figure out how to solve in order to get it to work. Oh, sorry, not this one. Uh, so working with dates and times, uh, we're going to do that using the date time module and the time delta class. Uh, the date time module is going to allow us to create, format, and manipulate dates and times very easily. Uh, time delta is going to be used to perform arithmetic operations on our date time objects, like adding or subtracting time from them. And uh, how we're going to use them is to create variables uh, based on input that we gather from our user. Now these next slides will be an introduction to the flow of the um, project. So the first thing we're going to have to figure out how to do is set the date range. And the purpose of that will be to filter our sales data from eBay's API. Some key variables we're going to create are a start date and an end date. And then we're going to make sure that these variables are returned in the correct format required by eBay's API. Then we're going to try to establish a connection to eBay's API and actually retrieve our sales data. <clears throat> we're going to do this using the trading class uh, from the eBay standard developers kit library to create a connection. And then we'll plug in our start date and our end date variables to specify the sales we want returned. And then we will make uh, an API call to the get orders endpoint of the eBay trading API and return all of our relevant data. So the way that our data is going to be returned uh, from eBay's API is in this nested data structure. So the order array is going to be the outermost dictionary of our nested data structure. And in that dictionary, there's going to be a key order. And what that's going to map to is a list of individual order dictionaries, which uh, in our case will be for a month. And then inside each of those individual order dictionaries, there will be a transaction array key. And that's going to map to a list of individual transaction dictionaries for each order. And uh, why that's set up like that. <clears throat> so what's inside of each transaction dictionary is all transactional data for a single item. So uh, just like one card in our case. So if someone just bought one card, the way their data would be returned is they would have their own order dictionary then that transaction array key is going to map to just a single transaction dictionary since they only bought one. Whereas if someone was to buy two cards, their data would be returned still in a single order dictionary, but now that transaction array key would map to a list of two transaction dictionaries, one for each card. And that gives sellers a way to keep track of um, their sales on an item by item basis and not just an order by order basis. So does anyone have any questions about that? Good. Um, so now we need to process and clean our sales data and get it ready for export. So we have our um, nested data structure. We're going to extract key data points from it, like item price, um, shipping, sales tax, and so on. Then we're going to perform some calculations to figure out the fees we pay and what our net sales are. And then lastly, we will have our organized data in a pandas data frame, and then we will export it to a CSV file. 
Let's hop over into the uh, code and go through this together. Is that good size-wise? Okay, cool. So here's the full list of um, libraries and modules we're going to use. Um, OS, we're going to use that to interact with our environment variables. And then here from the eBay standard developers kit library from the trading class, we are going to import connection and we'll alias it as trading for easier reference later on. So this is going to be our connection to eBay's trading API. And then from the exception class of the eBay standard developers kit library, we're going to import connection error. Um, we went over these. And then we're also going to import logging. Um, I like using logging because it gives you a flexible way to display messages to your terminal that's going to help you understand what your program is doing as it runs. And uh, we set up its basic configuration here. So this level, um, we set it to info. So that's the tag, and they rank in level of severity. Um, so you can change that to if you only want to show critical tags, and you can filter it that way. And then format, this is going to be the way it is displayed in our terminal. So level name, which is this tag, and then whatever message we create will be printed after that. So now we're going to load our environment variables into our script, and we're going to do that with OS using the .get method to go inside of our EMV file and get our dev ID, our app ID, our cert ID, and our user token, and load all of them into our program. And if there's an error with one or more of them, we will raise a value error and print out this message that one or more of our API credentials are missing. Uh, otherwise, we're going to create this function that is going to prompt a user for a year and month. And the first thing we're going to do is create this current year variable. And how we're going to do that is uh, from the date time module, we're going to use the dot now method. And what that's going to do when this line executes is your computer is going to check uh, what the date and time is at that moment. And then this dot year is specifying what we want it to return. And we're going to store it in this variable current year. And then we're going to use a, a while loop with a try and accept block to try to prompt our users for some input. So the first thing we're going to do is ask them to enter a year, um, convert it to an integer, and then store it in this variable year. This next line here is just a uh, very simple data validation line. So if the year is not greater than or equal to 2020 or less than or equal to the current year, we will print out a message uh, invalid year and then we will reprompt them. I just wanted to get in a good habit of having data validation lines if I'm gonna be asking uh, a user for input. And the reason I chose 2020 is because uh, I'm the only one who uses this program and that's the year I created my eBay store. So that's all I could think of. Um, so now similarly, we're going to prompt the user to enter a month convert it to an integer and store it in this variable month. And again, we have a little data validation line. So if the month is equal to or greater than one or less than or equal to 12, we will then return our year and month variables. Um, otherwise we will print this message that uh, we, they entered an invalid month. And we also have a accept block with a value error that will, um, this will trigger if I was to type like the month September instead of nine. So then it would prompt me to please enter a numeric value for the year and month. So next we're gonna create this function, uh, get date range, and it's gonna take our year and month variables that we just created as arguments. And the purpose of this function is to generate a start and end date range for the given year and month, first localized to Pacific time, and then later we will, we will convert them to UTC uh, for the API request. So we're gonna create this variable Pacific and use the Python time zone library and the dot time zone method to assign it this US Pacific um, standard time object. And we'll store it in this variable. Uh, then creating our start date variable, we'll first uh, localize it to Pacific standard time. And the reason we're doing that is because uh, that is what eBay's server, the time zone they're in. And before I did this, there was just a bug with my machine being localized to Eastern Standard Time that was causing an error um, when the data would be returned. But to create our start date, it will be the year that the user input, the month that the user input, and then this number one. What this number one is saying is we want it to be the very first day of that month, and then by default, the very first second. So this would be, uh, in our example, we're going to use today, September 1st at midnight. And then to create our end date, for every month other than December, we're again going to first localize it to Pacific time, and then it will be the, use, the year of the user input, the month, but this time we'll add one to the month, and then again this uh, one to be the very first day, so this would be October 1st now. And then we're going to use time delta 
to subtract one second from it to take us to the very last second of that previous month. So we capture all sales from the very first to the very last second. And then for December, uh, since there is no 13th month, it's a little different, but we do still localize it to Pacific Standard Time. And this time it's a year plus one taking us to the next year. And then you'll see there's an extra one. Uh, this is for, we want it to be the very first month of that next year. This one, again, is the very first day, by default, the very first second. And then, uh, again, we use time delta to subtract one second, take us the very last second of that previous year. Now we need to uh, convert these variables to UTC for eBay's API. And we're going to do that by taking our first our start date variable and then using this as time zone method from the Python time zone library and passing it this UTC time zone object and storing it uh, in our new variable start date UTC. Then we're gonna do the same thing with our end date using this as time zone method, uh, passing it this UTC object and storing it in a new variable. And then the last step for that is uh, eBay's API requires it be in a ISO 8601 format. So we're going to do that by taking our start date variable and using this dot string format time. And what you're looking at in these parentheses is uh, the requirements for it. So the uh, Y represents the year in four digit form. Everything else will be in two digit form. The M is month. The D is day. Um, this character T just separates the date from the time. H is hours, M is minutes, S is seconds, uh, 0. 0.000, that's milliseconds. And then this Z is gonna represent the time zone. And in our case, we want it to be UTC. And we're going to do that exact same thing with the end date, end date UTC variable with the uh, dot string format time and pass it those same parameters. So now we're gonna create this function, um, extract decimal. And the extract decimal function is designed to extract a value from a nested data structure like the one returned by eBay's API. Um, it's going to help us retrieve values like our transaction price, shipping costs, or taxes in a way that is flexible and will handle uh, missing or optional data fields gracefully. So the uh, arguments it takes is transaction, which if you remember will be um, that dictionary that represents all the transactional data of each item. This key path is going to be a list of keys that it's going to use to travel through the nested data structure until it finds the key we assign it. And then this default, we set this to zero. What this is, is for example, things like um, sales tax. If someone has a certified reseller's license on eBay, they don't pay sales tax. So that um, value could be empty. So we'll just pass it this default so it doesn't crash our program. And the way this is going to work is we are going to assign each transaction dictionary to this value variable. Then we're going to loop through each key in the key path. And while we do that, we're going to use the dot get method to just keep going to the next key until we find the one we've assigned it. And then what it's going to do after it gets that value is return it in a rounded decimal format. And how we're going to do that is uh, again using the dot get method to now find the value of whatever key that we assigned it. If nothing is present, we pass it our default. And then we use this dot quantize method and this decimal 0 0.01. What this is saying is when you find this value, uh, return it to us two decimal places and then rounding, we set to round half up. So what that's doing is checking that third decimal place. If it's five or greater, it'll round it up. Otherwise it'll leave, leave it be. And that's just the uh, standard practice in finance. So that's why we have it that way. And uh, this function is going to be something we call in our process sales data function. So um, if there's any questions, they might be cleared up when we get to that. Now we're going to create this uh, function, fetch sold items. This is going to be our um, connection to eBay's API and actually retrieving our data. So it's going to take two arguments, our start date and end date uh, variables that we created. And we're going to use a try block to here we are creating an instance of the trading object, which is our connection to eBay's trading API that we got from eBay standard developers kit. And it takes these six parameters. So domain is going to be api.ebay.com. And then it will be our four environment uh, credentials and then configuration file. You can set that to none because we're loading ours from a uh, .env file. And now uh, this line, this block, uh, we're going to call the execute method of our API object that we just created. And it's going to take uh, two arguments, the first one being the get orders endpoint of the eBay trading API. 
and next being this dictionary, which is uh, the parameters. So for detail level, we're going to return all, create time from will be our start date variable, create time to will be our end date variable, order status, we only want completed orders and include vinyl value fee, that's set to true. What that is, is just the percentage of fees I pay uh, per sale as an eBay seller. Um, and if everything goes well, we'll have a logging message that the API call was successful and we will return um, the API's response in a Python dictionary. And then we have a few accept blocks, uh, one being for the connection error. And if that occurs, we'll have a error message um, that, that a connection error occurred with the name of the error. And then we also have an exception block just for any unexpected errors that occur. So now we're gonna create this function, process sales data, and it's gonna take the argument orders. And I would quickly like to show that orders is, so the function we just went over that returns that response dictionary, we assign it to this variable orders. So that's where that comes from. So the first thing this function will do is uh, it's gonna check to see if there's any data in orders. And if there's not, it will have a logging warning message that there's no orders to process and we will return an empty data frame. So our program doesn't crash. But otherwise we're going to create this variable order array. And uh, in hindsight, this wasn't the greatest variable name. This isn't gonna be the dictionary. This is actually gonna be the list of individual order dictionaries that I just named it this. Uh, we're gonna get this using the uh, .get method to go in our response dictionary, which is now this variable orders, and it's gonna look for the order array, and then it's going to use the .get method again to find each individual order dictionary. Then we're gonna create an empty list. Um, we're gonna call it items. And then uh, in this nested for loop right here, uh, the outer loop is going to go through each order in the order array. So what it's going to do is go through each order dictionary in that list. And then what the inner loop is doing is it's going through each transaction dictionary in each order. And it's going to do that um, by um, using the dot get method again to find the transaction array. And then from there, uh, dot get method again to find each transaction dictionary. And here's going to be where we call our extract decimal function. So we're going to create this variable item price and how we're going to get it is call our function, assign it uh, the transaction dictionary, and then assign it this key. So the key path now is going to look loop through the nested data structure until it finds this transaction price. Then it's going to return its value in that rounded decimal format and store it in this variable. And we're going to do that same thing for shipping costs, sales tax, final value fee, and handling cost. And then we're going to create this variable sale price. And what this is gonna be is the total that the buyer pays out the door. So that will be the item price plus the shipping cost plus the sales tax plus handling cost. And the reason we need to create this variable is because you cannot return a promoted listings fee from eBay's trading API. And uh, what that is, is I promote all of my listings at 2%. And if it sells from one of eBay's ad slots, I pay that extra fee. But if it sells organically, I don't have to pay that fee. Um, so my current workaround is to just hard code it into the script. And that really, I got lucky, it really only works because I use the same percentage for everything. So to get the ad fee, we're going to take the sale price and then use the decimal module to times it by uh, 0 0.02, which is 2%. And then our same line here to return it two decimal places and round it half up. And another thing that you can't return from the eBay trading API is the insertion fee, but that is a relatively straightforward fee. So we can just use a simple if else statement. So if you sell something for $10 or less on eBay, you pay a flat 30 cent fee. Whereas if it's greater, you pay a flat 40 cent fee. And then again, we're going to round it to decimal place or return it to decimal places and round it half up. Uh, so like I said, you can't return the promoted listings fee. So I have to um, return a net sale without ad fee and net sale with ad fee for every item I sell is my current workaround. So we're gonna create those variables here and we're going to do that by um, the net sale without ad fee will be the sale price minus sales tax, minus final value fee, minus insertion fee, minus uh, shipping cost. And then our same line here to return it to decimal places and round a half up. And then the net sale with ad fee is a relatively straightforward process. It's just our net sale without ad fee variable minus our ad fee. 
And then same idea here to return it to decimal places and uh, round a half up. So you'll see a bunch of uh, logging messages here. Um, the reason these were originally put in is because when I first got this to work and I was getting a response from eBay's API, I was really excited, but uh, like a third of my data was all wrong. So uh, I just hand, hand coded um, what it's getting for every single variable I'm trying to return and also how it's uh, figuring these things out. And from that, I was able to figure out that it was the promoted listings fee that was throwing off all my data. So I even added uh, two more messages to show how to get the calculations for the net sale uh, without ad fee and the net sale with ad fee. And I left these in here because they're helpful to um, sometimes a sale that it returns still looks kind of funky. So it's nice to just hop back into my terminal, look at what this is telling me, and then compare it to my eBay sales page. But uh, now we're going to create a dictionary for each item or card that we sell. And we're going to do that by taking the title and we'll find that from the transaction dictionary, the item key, and then the title key. Our sale price will be our sale price variable converted to a float. Same thing uh, with our net sale without ad fee and net sale with ad fee. And the reason we can now convert these to a float is because we're done doing any calculations on them and they're already rounded. So now we're just displaying them. So um, I just wanted to make that clear. And then uh, this stands for cost of goods sold. And this is just empty because we're going to append each item dictionary to that empty list we created at the beginning of this function, items. And then we're going to return items as a pandas data frame. So that's the reason this dictionary, dictionary is set up this way. Um, these five keys are going to be the columns in our spreadsheet. So uh, if name equals main, in simple terms, this just means uh, please only run this script if it's the main thing being ran and not on import. So what our program is actually going to do when it runs is first prompt our user for a year and month. Uh, return those variables, then it's going to call the get date, get date range function that takes those uh, variables as arguments and return our start date and our end date. Then we're going to call our fetch sold items function, which is our uh, connection to eBay's API and that returns our response dictionary. We're going to store that in this variable orders. And then it's going to check if there is data in orders. And uh, if there is, it's going to call our process sales data function that we just created that returns this pandas data frame. And we're going to store that data frame in this variable sales data df. And once we have that variable, we're going to use the um, dot to CSV method. And what you're looking at here, this could be anything. This is just the name of the CSV file we're going to create. And then index equals false. That's just saying don't uh, don't import the column ID into our CSV file. And then if everything goes good, we will print uh, data exported to our CSV file. So I would like to try and run this for you guys. Internet, there we go. Okay. Okay, so now you can kind of see what's going on. There's a lot, there's definitely a lot going on in the terminal, but uh, you know, you just find like, here's the title and then here's how it's um, figuring out all of its calculation details. And then most importantly here, our data exported to sales data, CSV. So here's our CSV file. It has our five columns. So title, sale price, net sale without ad fee, net sale with ad fee, and then the cost of goods sold uh, placeholder along with all of our sales for the month. So for September, we had 59 sales, which is about average. Uh, when you save this to your desktop, uh, it kind of looks something a little bit like this. So uh, as you can see, it is not fully automated, but this is still uh, a lot better than having to do all of this by hand. It used to take me about three hours. Now I'd say this process takes me no longer than about 30 minutes. So I'm really happy with it. I just have to go through and do something like this and um, then merge these columns and paste the values. But uh, yeah, so I'm really happy with it for now. So uh, some future enhancements and disclaimers. Uh, my main goal is to figure out a way to retrieve the net sale properly. 
for further automation. And I did just recently learn that you can promote, uh, return the promoted listing fee, but it's from the finance API. So hopefully I'll have that fixed soon. Uh, there's also an issue with um, fetching your data when something is sold with free shipping. But after a weekend of wanting to pull my hair out, I found in a forum on uh, the eBay developers website that this is currently an issue with eBay's API. So uh, that made me feel a little bit better about myself. And then once uh, those two things are solved and I can truly rely on the data being returned, I'd like to take it a step further and automate this program to just run on the first of every month. And then maybe one day way in the, way in the future, develop some sort of front end experience and add notifications for uh, sales milestones. Mm -hmm. So this project in its current form is available on uh, Git, uh, my GitHub. Um, I think if anyone runs an eBay store and they want to um, have some help tracking their sales, it can be a great help. Um, something to remember though, is there are things that are hard-coded very specifically to how I run my store, like the ad fee. So if you are uh, gonna use it, I would just use it as a framework. And from there you can fine tune it to your store's needs. And then uh, lastly, I just really like to say thank you to anyone who took time out of their day today to listen to me present this. This was uh, the first program I ever made that had any impact in the real world. And it has given me a ton of motivation to continue to learn and uh, work on awesome projects in the future. So it was an honor to present to you guys today. Thank you.